Um, um, we are unique in that we do research, we do advocacy, uh, we do protect land, we, we actively educate uh, to all ages. A few slides here of some of the different areas. Um, if you haven't ever checked it out, you might want to go on the website and look up current study. You see some real neat animations of how the waters in the bay move and how how long water stays in the bay. We active we're actively doing eagle surveys for many years in conjunction with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, um, doing archaeology years and years, like 30 years worth of water quality monitoring. And we use our uh, research to inform our advocacy. Uh, a lot of the advocacy is around fish restoration. You can see some examples of some really gross examples of turbine mortality when fish are trying to pass through the hydroelectric dams, the eel on the upper left and the eel life down below. Uh, we post the area for fish consumption advisories for mercury and, and PCBs, dioxins. And we've used our water quality work to upgrade the lower Androscoggin, uh, finally, and the lower Kennebec years ago. <clears throat> Working with kids over the years because they are our future. <clears throat> um, things were on a little bit of a pause during COVID in terms of uh, really close work. We did some great uh, theater work with them still. Uh, and some of that's online. And this last fall, we got Bay Day back again, which was wonderful. And, uh, and we'll be having a spring Bay Day on, I think it's May 14th, thereabouts. Protecting a lot of land, over 1,500 acres by now of land around the bay. Focus being on wildlife habitat because there is plenty of recreational habitat around. <clears throat> if you like the program tonight and have people that want to watch, uh, we are recording, as I say, and on the home page of ours, which is friendsinmarimini.org, ref1b.org, scroll down the right side under education, and you'll see a little speaker series video list, and you can click there, and, and you'll see a link within a couple of days to this presentation, and lots of them going back 10 years or so. <clears throat> we didn't record them in the way old days, so we're in the middle of the series here. Uh, the next one will be about... Um, by Hillary Peterson, who does integrated pest management in the state and talking about some biocontrol, uh, not just insect, but vegetation as well, uh, that she's doing around the bay. So our speaker tonight, John Burroughs, he's executive director of US operations for Atlantic Salmon Federation, or ASF. Um, ASF is an international nonprofit dedicated to the conservation and restoration of wild Atlantic salmon and their ecosystems. And uh, for those of you that don't know, the only place in the country there are wild Atlantic salmon are right here in Maine. Um, John oversees ASF's restoration and conservation programs, communications and advocacy activities in this country. And he's been with ASF since 2000s, worked on a variety of regulatory and policy issues. Um, Federal, Ener Federal Energy Regulatory Commission or FERC, hydropower relicensings, uh, habitat connectivity and river restoration projects, including a removal of several large dams. Under ASF's Maine Headwaters Initiative, John and other ASF US staff have completed more than 50 small dam removal and fish passage projects across Maine, restoring access to more than 1,200 acres, 1,200 miles, sorry, of river and more than 30,000 acres of lake and pond habitat. And John uh, earned his bachelor's degree from Gettysburg uh, College, BA, and he's got a master's in environment and sustainability from the Yale School of Environment. So with that, I'm going to turn my screen over to John. And Great. Except now I have Martin. Nope. Martin, we saw you eating dinner. <laughs> so, all right, you guys. Patrick. Got you your see big my screen now. Time. You're ready to rock and roll. Thank you. I am. I'm all set. Thank you. Can you hear me okay, guys? Yes. Awesome. Well, Ed, thank you for that great introduction. I'm really happy to be here tonight to talk about wild Atlantic salmon um, in the Kennebec River. Um, as you mentioned, I've been with ASF now for over 23 years. And from my very first day on the job, I've been advocating for improved fish passage and dam removal and fisheries restoration on the Kennebec River. I'm so very happy to share some information with you guys about that tonight and to talk about this river that's become 
incredibly important to me, both professionally and personally over the years. Um, outline for my presentation, I want to mention briefly a little bit about ASF for folks who don't know about us. I'm going to give a very, very brief life history of Atlantic salmon. Then I'm going to talk about um, Atlantic salmon recovery and what the goals actually are for the species here in Maine. Um, then I'll transition into talking about why the Kennebec is absolutely essential to Atlantic salmon recovery. And then at the end, talk a little bit about where we are at in terms of regulatory issues um, with the foremost, lowermost main stem dams on the Kennebec River. As I mentioned, ASF, we're an international nonprofit. We're dedicated to wild Atlantic salmon conservation and restoration and protecting their environment. We right, currently have a little bit over three dozen staff um, spread between Maine, Quebec, and Atlantic Canada. Altogether, we've got five state and provincial councils and more than 100 affiliated groups that comprise 25,000 members and volunteers. Um, we do a lot of work in a lot of different areas. Um, one of our major kind of pillars of our organization is doing original research. We've got a whole research and environment department based up in New Brunswick. And one of the cutting edge things that we've done over the last well, 21, 22 years is actually tracking um, Atlantic salmon smolts, which are the life stage at two or three years old, that are leaving our rivers, heading to the ocean and up to Greenland. We're tracking them from rivers both in Maine as well as Canada. And in recent years, we've been tagging adult salmon off the coast of Greenland and are being able to track their migration back to North America. Our, our headwaters work, which I'd mentioned, is really the major thing we're doing here in Maine. And those are our restoration projects, everything from small dam removals to building fishways um, to replacing road, cul road culverts. And there's actually several folks on here tonight listening that are our partners from different agencies and uh, consulting groups and volunteers that have helped with us, helped us with many of these projects over the years. We have a new program called Wild Salmon Watersheds, which is looking at creating a network of protected salmon rivers and watersheds across Canada where populations are still healthy. Um, that's a big, big new effort and initiative for us that's just kicked off in the last year or so. And we're looking to grow from three pilot projects we have currently um, to 15 um, wild salmon watersheds over the next four to five years. Uh, another big area for ASF is addressing um, open net pen salmon aquaculture, which um, in the North Atlantic, in North America and Europe is one of the major threats to wild Atlantic salmon. And so we do, do a lot of work on that front, on the regulatory side and the advocacy side. And then also, as Ed mentioned, here in Maine, we spent a lot of time and effort dealing with fish passage and advocating for dam removal at dams that are regulated by the Federal Energy Reg Regulatory Commission. Uh, briefly, you know, I just want to share some pictures and talk about our, our headwaters projects. I said that's a between that and dealing with big hydro dams, um, that's the bulk of what we do here in Maine. Um, headwaters work started uh, close to a quarter century ago with a couple of very small projects and here and there, we tackle a small dam or a fishway project or maybe a road crossing. And over the last six to seven years, we really um, amped up this program. And right now we've got actually two and a half staff um, working almost completely on this. Um, and at this point, we've actually done about 60 projects. Uh, it's more than 1,100 miles of river and stream that we've opened up. And at, at this point, it's a little bit over 30,000 acres of, of habitat. That's within about 25 years. Over the next six years, we want to do another 30 projects and open up another 900 miles of habitat and 12,000 acres of habitat. Um, so right now we've got about two dozen projects and we're doing work in the Sabattis River in Androscoggin, work in the Sandy River in the Kennebec, um, different portions of the Penobscot River, and also have a few projects in the Downeast Rivers, particularly in the Machias and the Narraguegas Rivers. Um, and now just to talk about the salmon life history, the life cycle, um, just so folks kind of understand the complexity of Atlantic salmon and kind of what their life history is. Adult Atlantic salmon you know, come into our rivers and streams starting in May, um, coming back from the ocean. They'll come in all summer long and into the fall. They'll spawn beginning in late October, and that will last up until December. 
adult Atlantic salmon don't die after spawning. I mean, many do, but they're not programmed to die like Pacific salmonids, and they can live to um, repeat spawn many, many times, which is an incredibly valuable life history trait for the species. Um, immediately after spawning, adult salmon will move back downstream. They'll spend winters in lakes, ponds, impoundments, or in the estuary. And then the eggs um, will spend about five to six months incubating in the gravel in our rivers and streams. And then salmon will hatch out in the springtime, spend a little more time living within the gravel as elven, and then emerge and start swimming around um, in basically very late spring or early June um, as salmon fry. Um, the juvenile salmon in Maine typically spend about two years in the fresh water, um, going from fry to the par stage, then to the smolt stage. In some rivers, particularly along the coast, like the Sheepscot River, we have some fish that actually will leave after about one year um, growing. Um, that's because that river, you know, has higher temperatures, more nutrients, fish are able to grow faster um, and bigger in a shorter period of time versus fish that are rearing um, in the headwaters of the Kennebec River in the Sandy or parts of the Penobscot, like the upper Piscataquis or the East Branch. Um, you have a number of those fish that actually will spend three years um, in the fresh water growing to the smolt stage. And the smolt stage is one of the um, kind of most difficult transition periods for Atlantic salmon. It's the period in the springtime when they are getting ready to leave the fresh water where they've been for a few years and make a very difficult transition to the estuary and the ocean environment. They are leaving our headwater streams and rivers um, at a very quick pace in the springtime. And they've got a very short window to be able to, to, be able to transition from living in the fresh water to living in the marine environment. And as they go head out into the Gulf of Maine, they are traveling as fast as they can for um, the Labrador Sea to the north of Newfoundland, to the east of Labrador. And very, very quickly, um, these, what they're called post smolts, once they open, uh, enter the ocean, they are traveling around Nova Scotia um, to both the west and the east of Newfoundland. And they're meeting up with salmon smolts from other rivers. Um, the fish are, are schooling together with fish from all across Canada and moving in mass together to the Labrador Sea where they'll spend their first winter. Um, a small portion of those fish, anywhere from 10 to 30%, will actually come back after one winter and enter our rivers again to spawn. But the vast majority will continue the migration north and go to the waters off West Greenland, which are incredibly rich waters, a tremendous amount of food there to help salmon grow really big, really fast. Then after a second winter in the sea, they'll come back. Um, a small number will spend three winters, um, but the vast majority of our salmon are spending two winters in the ocean, coming back, heading up our rivers to spawn again and repeating the life cycle. Um, just to give folks a, a sense of where we are, don't expect anyone to see the details on this, but this is a map of every Atlantic salmon river in North America. Um, Atlantic salmon historically ranged from Western Connecticut all the way to Ungava Bay. Um, there's about 1,100 rivers that had Atlantic salmon in them historically. Um, and of those, you know, they've virtually gone extinct in most of the rivers in the United States and a lot of rivers in the southern part of the range in Canada, but are doing really well um, the further north you go in Canada. And so just zooming in, this shows the, the rivers in, in New England um, that had Atlantic salmon. There's some debate about whether or not salmon went up the Hudson. Um, it's not very clear if they did or not. Um, very quite possible that they did, but altogether we had 60 rivers um, that supported Atlantic salmon. And our big watersheds like the Penobscot, the Kennebec, the Connecticut, um, you had unique runs in different tributaries. Um, so we would have, you know, at least a half a dozen different kind of subpopulations or unique distinct populations within the Penobscot watershed. And probably in the Kennebec as well, we would have a population that went up the Sebastocook that went up the Sandy River, the Carabasset, that went up the Dead River. Um, and so we've lost everything to the west of Maine and in the southern part of Maine. And at this point in time, we really only have Atlantic salmon in um, nine different rivers in Maine. And so that led to you know, the, the listing of salmon um, as an endangered species back in 2000. Um, as for folks who are around in, in the late 90s and paying attention, the the decision to list Atlantic salmon was highly contentious. Um, it was, yeah, from what, what I hear, I started about 
two months before the listing was finalized. So I missed all the public hearings and that contention, but it was a pretty ugly scene from the mid nineties to about 2000. Um, but ultimately in November of 2000, in the waning days of the Clinton administration, um, salmon were listed as endangered in eight rivers, um, five down east, um, one tributary of the Penobscot called Cove Brook, and then the Duck Trap River, and then in the far southern part of the range, the Sheepscot River. That listing was expanded in 2009 to cover the large rivers of Maine, the Androscoggin, the Kennebec, and Penobscot. And the listing as it is today covers Atlantic salmon um, anywhere from the Androscoggin River north and east to the Denny's River. And so any salmon in any of those rivers is considered endangered under the ESA. And at the time of the original listing and then uh, the expanded listing and within the recovery plan that was finally developed for the species, um, the key threats were dams, our inability to address dams, not having the regulatory mechanisms to do that, then low marine survival and climate change. Uh, there's a whole host of other, other threats and issues from aquaculture to forestry, um, a whole bunch of things, but these issues right here are the major um, issues impacting Atlantic salmon today and will be for, you know, for time to come. One, one thing that we talk about in the salmon world is what the agencies have called shrews. These are essentially called salmon habitat recovery units. And so that area, that distinct population of Atlantic salmon that was protected has been broken up into these three areas. Um, and basically the recovery goals and criteria that I'll talk about in a minute apply equally in each, each of those three areas. So the Mary Meeting Bay Shrew basically comprises the Androscoggin, the Kennebec, the Sheepscot, and a couple of other rivers further up the coast. You've got the Penobscot Bay Shrew, which is the entire Penobscot watershed, and then a couple of the rivers that flow into Penobscot Bay. And then the Down East Shrew, which is the Union River, the Narragagas River, the Pleasant River, Machias River, East Machias River and Denny's rivers, um, which have salmon in them, as well as all the other rivers and streams that salmon can go into. Um, the agencies decided to do this as a way to ensure that when we get to recovery, that the species is spread out across the landscape, that it can experience a wide variety and diversity of habitats. As, as folks know, the, the headwaters of the Kennebec River and the Sandy or the Carabasset or the Dead River, um, are quite a bit different than rivers along the southern along the coast of Maine. Um, and so salmon are adapted to all those places. And we wanted to make sure that in the future they can experience those different environments because that leads to maintaining and increasing genetic diversity. And also it allows the species to overcome you know, adverse demographic and environmental events. A great example of that is the floods that we had in January or sorry, December of this year. Um, you know, that that's an environmental event that, you know, will have a big impact on the salmon population, you know, that was spawned in November and early December. Um, yet not all areas were hit the same with that. And so certain rivers will be hit wor worse than others. And when you have populations spread out like that, it allows for the species to be able to deal with, with those types of events. Um, it's important, I think, to talk about, you know, the recovery criteria that the agencies have set. And there's kind of three main areas. Um, there's a goal for abundance of the species, a goal for productivity, and then a habitat goal. And you know these are things that are, were established back, uh, became finalized about five years ago. So to go from an endangered to a threatened status, we need to have 500 wild or what they're called naturally reared salmon coming back to at least two of those three shrews. Uh, naturally reared salmon is one that originated from an egg that was planted or a fry or a par that was stocked into those rivers. So we need to have 500 in those two or three, two of those three areas, as well as 1,500 overall. Um, for productivity, we need to make sure that the population is replacing itself, that has a positive growth rate, and we need to have a minimum of, of 7,500 habitat units. Um, to delist the species completely, we need to have 2,000 wild wild adults in each of those three areas, um, and at least 6,000 adults across the DPS. Not a single hatchery fish you know, can count towards that. And again, we also need to make sure that the population is replacing itself. And under a delisting criteria, we need to make sure that there's less than a 50% probability 
that the population of you know, 6,000 adults won't fall before 500 adult spawners in the next 15 years or three generations. And that's all derived from doing a population viability analysis. And lastly, for habitat, each of those three areas needs to have 30,000 units of spawning and rearing habitat that are accessible and also suitable. And so this is um, some slightly depressing information about where we are at with both of those goals. Um, right now, you know, we're, we're talking dozens to uh, 100 to 150, you know, depending on the shrew, um, truly wild or naturally reared fish coming back. Our returns last year, um, they haven't been officially counted yet, but are gonna be close to about 1,900 to maybe 2,000 adults wild, naturally reared, and smolt stocked fish, um, with you know very small percentages of those actually being wild or naturally reared. Um, the good news is we're seeing progress on that front, um, you know, particularly in the Penobscot and also in the Mirror Meeting Bay Shrew, largely because of the Kennebec. On the habitat side, you know, we're, we've already met the threatened criteria, and for the delisting criteria, now, we're well on our way in down East Maine. The Penobscot shrew, um, there's a major issue with one dam there, but that will be addressed in the next three to four years. Um, but then we've got Mirror Meeting Bay, where we're only at 41% of that 30,000 units. And we, we can't get much more than 41% um, without making the Kennebec work and getting salmon to the upper Kennebec River. Uh, there's just not enough designated critical habitat and not enough good habitat um, that's accessible elsewhere in that area. And I would say at this point, the vast majority of the habitat in the Sheepscot River, which has the southernmost genetically distinct population, is almost all accessible. Um, we've got a little bit of habitat in the lower Androscoggin and a little bit in the Madomic and the St. George River, and then some of the tributaries of the Kennebec. But the vast, vast majority of the habitat and all of the really, really good habitat is above four dams on the Kennebec River. Um, and lastly, just talking about uh, where we are with replacement rate, the Mirror Meeting Bay Shrew is the only one of those three areas that is well above the replacement rate. Um, everything fluctuates and the Penobscot is sometimes above, sometimes below. Um, the Down East Rivers, unfortunately, are often below there and sometimes above it. As a whole, the entire population is right around 1%. Um, we're not really losing any ground at this point. Things have been stable for um, about 15 years. So I think that's really good news. But the really important thing here is the reason why Mary Meeting Bay Shrew is well above the others is because of the work that's happening in the Sandy River with the stocking restoration program that Maine DMR is doing that relies entirely or almost entirely on planting salmon eggs in the gravel. Um, that approach uh, eliminates virtually all of the negative impacts that you get from, from hatcheries. And the productivity in parts of the Cassandra River is just phenomenal. And so we've got a population that's growing in the, in the Sandy River in the Kennebec. And it's only really been an active restoration program for 16 or 17 years. We started with almost nothing and then back, you know, 15, 16 years ago, and have slowly increased over time. Um, actually, I'll just go back to one more thing. The, so last year in, in the Kennebec, we had almost 160 adults came come back. Um, 60 of those were wild or naturally reared fish. And we had a very large number of hatchery fish that came back. Um, which kind of ruins the bar on chart on the right, where we have a whole lot of naturally reared and wild fish for a very long time. Starting in 2000, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service decided to start stocking Atlantic salmon smolts in the Kennebec as a way to get more adults coming back to spawn. Um, we we those adults are coming back, and we saw last year we had you know over 100 of them. It's just that those adults you know perform much much more poorly than a wild or naturally reared smolt does. And we really don't have a great sense of how well they're gonna spawn and reproduce. And that's something that we'll be looking at with DMR to, to assess that. Um, so we went from having essentially for several years, a completely wild or natural run around 50 to 60 fish to 
a run that's now approaching 200, but has a much larger kind of hatchery component. So just to sum up that, that portion of things, we have, a, have had historically, historically being the last 15 years or so, a very high wild, we're naturally reared, the portion of salmon in the Kennebec River. We're the only area that's exceeding that productivity goal. And the Kennebec for the Miri Ming Bay Shrew has 70% of all of the Atlantic salmon habitat. So that's the vast majority of the habitat is in the Kennebec. And of that habitat, essentially all of the very high quality climate resilient habitat is above those four dams of the lower main stem of the river. Um, and so I wanted to show folks, um, for folks who are maybe not familiar with the upper Sandy River, um, kind of from Farmington North up to Strong, Phillips and Madrid, um, it's really an incredible, incredible river. It's high gradient, it's pretty undeveloped, very heavily forested. And it's just a really dynamic river. You've got massive amounts of sand and gravel, lots of good cold water inputs. And then you've got, you know, really deep pools and a river that moves a lot and changes. And it's just phenomenal rearing habitat for Atlantic salmon. And altogether, the Sandy watershed has 43,000 units. Um, that's more habitat than the Machias and Nariguegas rivers combined. And those are you know, the two biggest rivers in down East Maine. And so the Sandy River alone can get all of our recovery criteria. We can easily have 2,000 wild adults coming out of the Sandy or coming back to the Sandy and producing that and having really good habitat that'll support the species you know, for, for a long time to come. You know, so that's really a, a key reason why you know, the upper Kennebec, the Sandy River is just critical to Atlantic salmon recovery. Um, so kind of transitioning to the dams, um, the map on the right shows the dams in the watershed. Um, those four dams are the Lockwood Dam, Hydro Kennebec Dam, Shamit Dam, and the Weston Dam. They're all owned by um, Brookfield Renewable Power US, which is part of Brookfield Asset Management, a large multinational company that's based in Canada. Um, they own those dams and several others, um, not just in the Kennebec, but also the Androscoggin, the Penobscot, the Union. Um, I think the entire Saka River um, is owned by Brookfield at this point in time. Um, we've been in an interesting situation for the last decade where um, Brookfield agreed nearly a decade ago to construct upstream fishways and downstream fish passage at um, the three of the four dams on the river that had no fish passage. Um, that was part of an interim species protection plan they developed with NOAA Fisheries back in 2014. Um, and in, interestingly, um, ASF and our partners in the Kennebec Coalition uh, have been fighting that approach for the last 10 years. And it, as Ed and other folks on here know, oftentimes in a regulatory process involving FERC, that we're doing all we can just to get fish passage built. Um, we, we advocate for dam removal, um, but you know that's a really tough uphill climb. And we often find ourselves just fighting for getting the best fish passage. And so in the Kennebec, somewhat perversely, we've been fighting fishways from being built, largely because our belief is that once tens of millions of dollars are poured into these dams in fish passage, it, it makes the prospect of getting dam removal to happen at any of them um, just far less like, likely to happen. Um, and so, you know, our big concern is, you know, there is nowhere in the world where you have wild Atlantic salmon that are self-sustaining, you know, above multiple hydro dams. Um, we can find places where they are self-sustaining at one hydro dam, but that's it. And so ultimately, you know, we've got to remove more dams on the Kennebec River. And as I think a lot of folks recognize, you now the Kennebec made history back when the Edwards Dam was removed, it'll be 25 years this July. And that's the first and the only time that FERC has um, basically ordered a dam to be removed against the wishes of its owner. Um, and so that's happened once, happened on the Kennebec and, you know, the prospects of FERC doing that again are definitely not great, but that's certainly what we're, we're working towards here on the Kennebec River at this point in time. I also think it's important to mention that you know, before Edwards came out, you know, you had five dams on the main stem and you also had um, a former hydro dam at the mouth of the Sydney River that was owned by Madison Electric Works Company. Um, that dam went out in 2006, Edwards went out in um, 1999. 
And then a year and a half ago, we removed a dam in Farmington on a major tributary um, temple stream of the Sandy River. So just in a quarter century, you know, we've reduced the number of dams on the Kennebec watershed um, pretty significantly in terms of getting access to the Sandy River. And there have been a few other dam removals in the watershed during that time. Um, and so you know, we're very hopeful that we can make that stuff happen again moving forward. And so kind of wrap, wrapping things up, you know, I, there's been a lot of stuff that's happened over the last decade related to the FERC process, related to that interim species protection plan. And um, a few years ago, Brookfield proposed a final species protection plan. Um, but to kind of to cut to the chase, um, last spring after several years, NOAA Fisheries issued a biological opinion on that species protection plan. Um, and basically that plan is, you know, build upstream fishways where they don't exist, improve upstream fish passage at Lockwood, uh, put screens on turbines, do some shutdowns, um, raise some fish for studies and throw a little bit of money towards some restoration projects. Um, NOAA's biological opinion that came out last March basically said, yeah, these dams adversely impact salmon, but you know, we think that the plan that Brookfield put forward will not jeopardize the existence of the species nor prevent restoration of the species. Um, NOAA, through their analysis, believes that we can achieve 96% passage of Atlantic salmon, both upstream and downstream at every single dam. Um, and you know, we believe that that's just completely impossible to do based on our experience you know, going back a very long time in Atlantic salmon restoration and the status of the population, what happens you know, across the North Atlantic with Atlantic salmon. Um, and so at this point, you know, that biological opinion or that species protection plan is still pending before FERC. Before FERC. FERC ultimately makes a decision on whether to approve that, modify that, reject that. And they are gonna kind of go through that process in conjunction with the environmental review that's um, been happening for the Shamit Dam. And the Shamit Dam is um, the third dam of the four dams on the river. And that's the only one that's currently in relicensing at FERC. Um, a draft EA came out from FERC a couple of years ago and we advocated very strongly that FERC should do a full environmental impact statement. Um, and the agency, several of the agencies joined in with us on that and FERC agreed to do that. Um, that draft EIS has been delayed for, for a while now, but at this point, FERC is indicated or said that they're gonna release that by the end of March. So about a month and a half from now, we think they'll probably stick to that schedule. And the really critical thing here is that um, FERC is gonna look at the cumulative impact of all four of the dams. Um, not just at the impact on Shama Dam. Um, the also most critical thing, and probably the one point I'd like to get across to everyone here is there's a very extensive public comment period that comes with that um, draft EIS coming out. And there will be at least one, maybe multiple public hearings in the watershed, as well as a written public comment period. And a couple of years ago, I think some folks will remember that the state of Maine went through a process of trying to update the fisheries management plan for the Kennebec. And that became an incredibly contentious issue um, that involved the Seppi Paper Mill in Fairfield, um, you know, the communities up and down the watershed and DMR hosted during um, kind of the, the worst part of the, the COVID epidemic or pandemic, you know, public comment and public hearings on that and got huge turnout um, you know, massive amounts of comments went in supporting that. Um, but the issues related to the Shamit Dam and the potential impacts on the Seppi paper mill made the whole issue just completely political. And I think folks will remember the last gubernatorial election a year and a half ago, um, former Governor LePage really tried to make the issues around the Kennebec Dams, you know, a campaign issue and election issue at that time. Um, but all of that being said, there's gonna be an opportunity for everyone to weigh in um, in the Shamit relicensing on that EIS and to advocate for dam removal on the Kennebec River. We're anticipating FERC will issue a final EIS um, sometime in the fall. And you know, if we're unsuccessful at getting them to support or agree to dam removal um, during that process, you know, a new license will get issued for Shamit uh, about a year from now, maybe a year and a half from now. And then the licenses for the other three dams will also get modified at that point in time um, to incorporate the species protection plan. And then 
once that's approved by FERC, ultimately, there's a 10 year period where new fish passage is built and other protective measures get implemented. And then we're looking at the relicensing of the other three dams in the middle of the next decade. So our, our hope certainly is to avoid these last two bullets um, you know, for as many of the dams as possible and try to get um, as many of them removed. And I, th I think at this point in time, it's fair to say that you know, the, the prospects of FERC doing what we would like to do are not great, um, but there is still you know, regulatory opportunities and then legal opportunities to um, try to make things happen differently. And so just wrapping up, you know, because of the quality of the habitat in the upper Kennebec and just the sheer quantity of it, you can't recover the species in Maine without making the Kennebec work for Atlantic salmon. And it's going to have to produce the vast majority of those 2,000 wild fish for the mere beating bay shrew. And we know that you can't restore a self-sustaining or wild population of salmon with four dams. Um, one of the key things about the Species Protection Plan, you know, setting aside how effective upstream and downstream passage may be, it, it does not deal at all with you know really the cumulative impacts of the dams and how they degrade and alter you know the river environment they change habitat they alter you know, all kinds of different ecological processes and change temperature of the river they alter you know, the aquatic insects that live there and the you know the resident fish community you know it's 27 miles of impoundments and you know atlantic salmon and all the other fish that we're working to restore in the kennebec river are not adapted to live in you know, fake ponds created by dams. And so it's just critically important that you know, we remove as many of those dams as possible. Um, and ultimately, you know, if we wanna have salmon in the United States you know, for centuries to come, you know, it's gonna require that they get to places like the Sandy River and then afterwards places like the Carabasset or the Upper Main Stem, which are all really good places that are really good cold water um, they're climate resilient and are places that even under the worst kind of climate change scenarios will still be able to support brook trout and Atlantic salmon, you know, for well, well, well into the future. And so with that, I'll just close with you know, a few more shots of um, scenes from the, the Upper Sandy River. So thank you guys for, for your time and um, Ed, happy to delve into any questions. Sure. Thank you, John. That was great. Um, <clears throat> There was, um, um, and, and, and one thing I'll mention in terms of cumulative impact, when quite a few years ago, uh, F1B and I mean, Toxic Action Coalition, Doug Watts, we all filed the first ever lawsuit, citizens lawsuit under the ESA and the Clean Water Act against these dam owners and the lower dam owners on the Andro. And we ultimately had to stop because we didn't have any dead fish to throw on the floor in the courtroom. But if you do the math with, you know, the mortality that's modeled when fish go through these turbines, you know, it's bad enough to go through one, but by the time you go through four dams, you're pretty much down to like zero fish. So that cumulative impact is huge. And I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, one person asked the question, well, one person asked the question if these four dams are active hydro dams and the answer is yes. Um, but someone else uh, suggested that you might want to um, just uh, give folks a little intro on the different types of passage and why they are not as effective as the real thing. Sure. And I'm trying to cover that. You know, there's lots of different ways to, to pass fish, you know, pass dams. Um, it's kind of the, the, the thing for, for large river dams at this point in time is building fish lips. Um, they're essentially large elevators with hoppers that um, fish will are attracted to with some with some flow, um, and they'll swim in there, and some gates will close, and then they'll be lifted up and released into a flume, and then can swim through that and and pass up river. Um, you know that so that's what we have you now on the Seb Sebastocook River and the first dam on the on the Penobscot and Milford, and you know that's what's being proposed for. Um, the dams on the Kennebec that don't have fish passage. Um, a lot of the things you can do are building fish ladders of different types, um, and they can work well for certain species. Um, and the fish lifts can actually work well, you know, for for species as well. Um, the issue is when you're trying to pass, you know, a half a dozen or more species that, you know, are very different from each other. You know, fish ways you know, only work so well for different species. 
And then when you're dealing with mechanical fishways, you know, things break. And we have many instances where fishways break, something goes wrong during the height of the migration. And for fish like river herring, you know, particularly American shad or elwives, who are coming up to spawn in the spring, they've got a very small window of time where you know they can get to upper river areas or to lakes and ponds to spawn. And if the first dam on the river of the fishway is broken, they're not getting past there. In addition, you know, species like American shad are just notoriously difficult to pass, get past more than one dam. Um, you've got some places where you can pass large numbers of shad at the first dam. It's it's certainly not universal, but it, there are places where that does happen, but then numbers fall off dramatically at the second dam. And we've got places up and down the East Coast where we have you know, two, three, four dams we're trying to get shad past. And by the time you get to dam number three or number four, you're talking about zero, zero shad. Um, and so you can only engineer so much um, with fishways and you can never address you know, the ecological impacts from the dams and the impoundments that are there. Um, so yeah, if some fishways work and they can work well in places and we built several at lakes and ponds ourselves and our, we're passing large numbers of fish, but on a large main stem of a river, um, you know, particularly with a gauntlet of dams, you just can't expect to have any meaningful restoration of not just salmon, but these other species when you're dealing with that many dams. As I'll, I'll repeat the example I gave you before, John, as, as an example, last, uh, We've been counting shad below the Brunswick Dam <clears throat> for a number of years using underwater sonar. And last year we counted uh, between 10 and 16,000 shad just below the Green Bridge uh, on one incoming tide cycle. And for the whole season, that fishway passed three shad. Yeah. And at the, it's the same situation with Lockwood, which is the first dam on the Kennebec. Um, I don't know the best year, but it's in the low hundreds. But there's many years where it's zero. Or single fish in the population of shad in the lower Kennebec. I'm not sure what the estimate is. I know 20 years ago the estimate was in the tens of thousands. And if you, I've been out there fishing a few times in late May and June, and the river is just absolutely full of shad. So I wouldn't be surprised if the population is in the hundreds of thousands at this point, mm -hmm. and they're not getting above the first dam. Someone asked, given the sort of I think pretty much universally acknowledged acceptance that hatchery raised fish, at least the way they're often raised are not as resilient uh, as wild fish. Do you think that DMR should stop their hatchery program? Well, the uh, the DMR program in the Kennebec is egg planting. And so other than you know the selection of the adults in the hatchery to main or to maintain that genetic diversity so you're not inbreeding closely related fish, there are no hatchery impacts. So the eggs are planted in you know in February, early March in the river. They incubate, they grow out. That's it for for things. Where are so, those eggs coming from, John? Those eggs come from the the federal hatchery system, and they are at this point, you know, they are basically the same exact same fish from the Penobscot. They're Penobscot line genetic genetically of salmon. Mm -hmm. um, so they're at this point in time, the the population of fish in the in the Kennebec is essentially identical to what's in the Penobscot. Uh, so I would say that the smolt stocking that I, that I mentioned very briefly is basically the restoration program in the Penobscot depends on that. There's half a million or more smolt stock there, and you get adults back from that. The problem is, uh, particularly here in the Kennebec, um, we don't know how well those smolts as adults reproduce and how well their progeny do. In addition, the three years of smolt stocking in the Kennebec, those smolts were stocked below Lockwood Dam. And so they're coming back in pretty good numbers, yet they are not imprinted on the Sandy River. And, and so they're imprinted on the water below the Lockwood Dam. So you've got a significant amount of those fish swimming up the Androscoggin, some swimming up the Sebastocook, some going up rivers that we don't know about, and only a small percentage of those are finding the fishway in Waterville and then being trucked to the Sandy. And because they're not imprinted on the Sandy, um, a pretty large number of those fish, adults this past year or two, actually have left. And a significant number have actually shown back up at Lockwood, having swum back downstream through all four impoundments and all four dams. Okay. And so I think they are, the decision has been made to do the smolt stocking in the Sandy, which would be a huge step forward. And the concern was, we don't want to waste 100,000 smolts 
and have half of them killed at the dams. Um, that was literally the thinking of why you stock them below the dams. So that's going to change because of what Brookfield has been doing to shut down turbines um, during the spring, the last few years, we should see, you know, a very high number of those fish and the wild fish actually, you know, getting through the dams and out to the ocean. Okay. Um, there's a question about um, Weston and how relicensing up there, <clears throat> how, how that dam and the relicensing play into the efforts to have a uh, pretty serious whitewater uh, establishment up there, whitewater park. Yeah, no, that's a great question. We've, we've gotten that a lot. And so, you know, that, that Weston relicensing is still, you know, a dozen years off, but um, if we are unsuccessful at getting Weston removed, during that time, the fish passage will be built, and there is no impact on the Whitewater Park there, the Run of River project. Um, the whole project is outside of the Run of River project that's you know being developed. You know, is outside of the project area for the for the Weston Dam, and the Weston Dam, like the other three lower dams, is a Run of River dam. So the water that comes in is the water that goes out, um, and so we're removing that dam um, does not change the flow below it. Uh, it'll be essentially the same whether the dam is there or not. Um, and so removing that dam is completely compatible with having that whitewater park. And I, honestly, if you remove the dam and have another, I don't know, 12 miles of impoundment gone and all the way up to Madison, and, and I don't know if that's close to 20 miles, but you would have substantial natural whitewater as well, mm -hmm. you know, basically from Madison, Maine, all the way down there through the gorge, which would be a huge asset um, for recreation in the area. Okay, great. Um, any other questions? I don't see any in the, in the chat. No one there? I, I will say that I'm holding in the hand right now a celebratory stick of dynamite from the removal of Edwards Dam. Um, it's about an 18 inch long piece and uh, red with a fuse on it. And uh, May 26, 1998. And that was the first uh, working hydro dam in the country to come out. So um, hopefully we can. Uh, it's it's been it's been a slower rate since then, but we've done some great work, and you guys have really, um, you know, led the led the pack with that, and and, and kind of that coalition as well. So appreciate that. Any other oh. questions? Otherwise, we'll shut it down. You know. Oh, there's one. Um, are Atlantic salmon farmed? If so, does this have an impact on natural fish? Well, there's an easy question, John. <laughs> yep, they are massively farmed all over the place. I mean, not just in the North Atlantic, but in the South Atlantic and all over the globe. Um, yeah, it has a huge impact. And, you know, in, in Maine, you know, the industry in far eastern Maine is relatively small. And it's, I would say it's fairly well regulated. There's There's problems there, but it, it makes aquaculture in Maine, you know, definitely a secondary or tertiary problem. But when you look across Canada and, and you look in Europe, you know, Ireland, Scotland, Norway, um, the Atlantic salmon industry is big in, in all those places, you know, farm raised open net pen salmon, and they're having massive problems, you know, impacts on wild salmon. Anywhere you have, you know, an open net pen salmon industry, you are decimating your wild Atlantic salmon through escapes and genetic integration, you know, competition, each other, diseases, sea lice. It's just a situation across the globe where they're just not compatible with, with each other. Um, it's a it's a big, big problem, you know, kind of range-wise with the species. Um, Jens Jorgensen had his hand up. I'm not sure how we deal with that, except he finally figured out how to use the chat. And he asked, what can we do about this? How can we help? But I, I, the, the biggest thing is once FERC releases that draft environmental impact statement, um, you know, attending one of the public hearings that happens, you know, writing in comments, um, that does have an impact on the FERC process. And as we saw, you know, in that ill-fated management plan process a few years ago, I think we, the positive comments for dam removal, because that was, the state was basically saying for their plan, at least two of the dams had to go. And I want to say 99% of all the public comments that the state received was in support of that. Um, so I, I think, you know, moving forward because of the politics around the Shamit Dam and stuff that our governor has said about that, it may be tricky for the state to advocate for dam removal there, but letting the state know that there's a constituency 
that supports dam removal on the Kennebec um, will also would also be very helpful. Um, one of our members asked, "What about property owners along the river? They're often opposed to dam removal." Um, and I know we run into it more on smaller rivers often, but anywhere there's an impoundment, there's often opposition. Can you speak to that? Yeah, that's probably one of our biggest obstacles to dam removal. Our, our folks, who, not just folks who live on on the impoundment, but you know, have businesses in the community or been in the community for a long time and are used to seeing a dam in an impoundment, you know, in their backyard or in you know in their community. Um, and so, whether it's a large dam or a small dam, and sometimes it's the smallest dams that are the most controversial. We spend a lot of time, you know, you know with our partners at the state and federal agencies, and with our engineering firms and contractors that work with us on the technical side of things to you know, let folks know what the river will look like afterwards. And as more and more dams come out, we're fortunate that we've got a lot of places across the country and a lot of places in Maine where you've got really good before pictures and you can show folks whether pictures or take them there and show them that the river is gorgeous, you know, once the dam is, is out. It's different, absolutely. Um, but the things that we hear about that there'll be a trickle, there'll be a muddy ditch, you know, all that stuff, we can definitely show, you know, many, many dozens of places that that's not the case. And so as more of this stuff happens, it becomes a little bit easier um, for folks to kind of grasp that, that a dam coming out can be a good thing, but it is definitely a big challenge. And, you know, we dealt with that in the dam removal in Farmington that came out a few years ago and spent a lot of time on that. And we've got some other projects we're working on across the state where, um, you know, folks on the impoundment are definitely concerned and we're spending a lot of time, you know, working with them. And I, I think you get, you were able to convince some folks or bring folks over, but, you know, some folks just love the way it is. And whether it's concern about the aesthetics or recreation or, you know, perceived negative impacts on property values where, you know, there's been a fair amount of scientific literature looking at changes in property values when dams come out and, now, ultimately, there there is no negative impact um, based on you know, the peer-reviewed literature on that. Yet, convincing someone that that's the case in Farmington or, you know, Skowhegan or someplace else is, is a different story. So, I think that question hits on one of our biggest obstacles that we that we deal with. Yeah, I, you know, I'd be interested to know how the people up on the Sebastopol Hook um, feel about it now. That was there was obviously really tough opposition to removing Fort Halifax where it comes into the Kennebec. And, you know, now there's, you know, there's anywhere from three to six million L lives being passed over the first dam on the river now. I count over 300 eagles when I do a survey up there. And I don't know if any of those opponents have come around or not, honestly, but it's a beautiful river restored in that way. Yeah, and I, and I don't know. I mean, certainly that was one of the most contentious, if not the most contentious dam battle in the last 20 years, you know, be, after Edwards. Um, but yeah, it's been relatively quiet. I know a lot of folks appreciate the river and what's been restored there. Um, I know from other places that people who were vehemently opposed to removal after it happens, you know, will kind of come to you and say, yeah, no, this isn't so bad and I kind of like it. Um, but sometimes the ones who are most vocal, you know, even if they have changed their minds or or become ambivalent or are not going to admit that if they've spent five years yelling and screaming about it. Well, yeah, and, it's, and I'm sure it's one thing to say that to you or I privately and another thing to say it in public. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I, as, I, as I said, the, the more we're able to do this stuff, and I, one thing I want to say is, you know, there's a lot of other groups in Maine doing this kind of work. We've got great partners on the Kennebec, but you've got groups, you know, in all corners of the state working on dam removal and restoration. And, um, you know, so there's a big movement here in you know, folks are addressing these issues, you know, all over the place, are doing a very good job you know, advancing a lot of good projects. Uh, Jens asked a follow-up just about, are there any clear, clear help, having clear instructions for how citizens could help would be really helpful. And I, I think it's probably fair to say that as some of these opportunities present themselves, that you guys and us and other groups will probably issue action alerts to our members at least yeah. right with with yeah. some specifics on what people can do or what the, help help them with what they could say and what they could write yeah no absolutely we'll certainly have you know instructions and information on how to how to weigh in whether it's in writing or at the public hearings and so 
one thing can do was, you know, contacting me or, or Ed. And um, I, I think once that EIS, draft EIS comes out, you will be seeing, you know, stuff in the papers about this. And um, some of the big debates and contention we had a couple of years ago is going to reemerge. So I don't think it's going to be hard to miss when it happens. And we can certainly help guide folks on how to submit comments or, or, or where to go and participate in the public hearing. Um, Bob asked if there are, are there any countries that are models for dam removal? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff beginning to happen in Europe in different places. You know, there's been some big projects in France and other parts of other parts of Europe. But I would say that you no, know, I think the U.S. is probably the leader in the world. You know, there may be a country I'm missing, but we've had definitely in the thousands. You know, at least a thousand you know, dam removals in the last 25, 30 years in this country. And the pace is speeding up, and it certainly some states themselves have removed hundreds of dams, um, you know, out there. So I think the U.S. is probably at the front of the curve on that. We should mention that we, while, while our talk tonight's focused on these big hydro dams, there's, you know, a gazillion old non-hydro dams out there that are blocking passage. And uh, those are really important as well. Yeah. And just on that, you know, there's really within the, within Maine, within the Salmon Rivers at this point, there's really only a really small handful of hydropower dams that we need to address. Um, some that will stay and just need really good passage, others we want to see removed, but it's a pretty small number. But we have, we have over 400 small non-hydro dams that are out there, um, many of which have no fish passage and very little regulation. They're not regulated by FERC. Um, there's, unless they're a high hazard dam, um, the state of Maine and MEMA doesn't regulate them. And so you literally have a whole lot of dams clogging the landscape, serving no purpose and are out there crumbling. And eventually mother nature will take them away, but you know, you're talking centuries for that to happen. And that's definitely a, a big issue you know, across the state. Um, uh, Nick has a, um, oh, actually El Ellen asked to, to define imp an impoundment, but it's just the area that where the water is impounded behind it behind a dam yeah and, and in the case of the run of the river dam you still might have an impoundment but it's probably much smaller than with a really really large dam because running the river means high water the river will go over the top of the dam as well yeah so it's so on the on the kennebec for example both the shaman impoundment and the western impoundment are about 12 miles long um so they're run a river and they're, they're allowed to fluctuate that head pond i think by a foot maybe it's a little more than that um and so you know, there's a relatively consistent water level. Um, and then they're basically letting out, you know, you've had got a thousand cubic feet of water per second coming into that impoundment from the upper Kennebec. You know, they're basically releasing that same amount at the dam itself, below hand, below. So you could, you could have a massive impoundment, you know, you could have an impoundment 50 miles long, um, but if it's run a river, it's just basically the habitat or the stream below the dam is getting the same amount of water that would be getting naturally. And uh, yeah, Nick asks, you'd be interested in data that shows the effect of dam removal on wildlife diversity and populations across adjacent habitats. And uh, he is asking, are Atlantic salmon considered a keystone species? Everyone always likes to call their species a keystone. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure they are, but uh, no, I, I don't know if they are. They're I certainly think uh, herring, river herring would be, you know. Yeah, I would say Atlantic salmon fall are probably our charismatic megafauna, but in terms of a keystone species, it's it's your river herring, LY's blueback herring in particular, that they're the keystone ecological species for the Gulf of Maine. Um, just because they are we're here historically in such massive numbers, you know, tens of millions of those fish coming up our rivers every spring. You know, across the Gulf of Maine and producing hundreds of billions of juveniles that are feeding everything in the river, the estuary, and the Gulf. So that that would be our our keystone species. Okay. John, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. For the rest of the evening, thank you all for coming very much. <laughs>